This week on the CPTSD podcast, we're going to have Asha Clinton, the developer of Advanced Integrative Therapy, talk with us about the deep, dark depression that comes with complex trauma, as well as this core to our being called our center and how we can start to move some of that darkness and that heaviness out of our life. This is part one of a two-part series because we just had too much to talk about. So see you inside and again in the next episode. Welcome back, everybody, to the CPTSD podcast. I am Tabitha Bird Weaver, your host. I'm a licensed therapist in the state of Oregon. And on this podcast, we talk about complex trauma, what it entails, and ways that you can heal. I am absolutely geeking out uh, right now because one of my biggest mentors and persons who has impacted my life the most, Dr. Asha Clinton, uh, creator and um, founder of Advanced Integrative Therapy is joining us today. We're going to be unpacking one of the issues that comes frequently with complex trauma, and that is the dark, deep depression that can accompany it. It feels heavy. It feels deep and sometimes like it's unmovable. So we're going to be diving into that today. Asha, I just wanted to start off by saying um, there's been a recent book by Dr. Lissa Rinkin, who is very popular in the um, trauma and self-help world. And she talks a lot about AIT in that book. There's a whole chapter dedicated to it. So first of all, congratulations. Um, I'm really glad that AIT is becoming more and more prevalent. Thank you. You're welcome. (laughs) Welcome. In that book, she talks about the fact that AIT definitely treats trauma and there is a cognitive part to AIT. There's a body related part to AIT. But she talks about how AIT can really get in and help people with the spiritual component. And I feel like for me, in my experience, that this depression that we're talking about or going to be talking about can sometimes feel like a spiritual issue because people do not feel whole when they have that depth of pain and suffering. And so I'm wondering if we can start there. What is it that we can do as clinicians and as people to start mitigating some of that darkness that hurts us so deeply? That's a really good question. The first and most obvious thing we can do is notice it. Mm -hmm. So many people come into my office and they say, I'm just fine, but my marriage is bad. And I listen to the, my marriage is bad because of course this is a person who's hurting, a person who may be very angry. But at the same time, I'm wondering what the real emotional component is in this person's life today. And I'll start asking about it. Some people, are trying to hide a lot because they don't want anyone to know how bad they feel. Mm -hmm. Other people simply refuse to start growing because they're afraid they won't be able to handle it. There are so many responses to that beginning question of why are you here and what do you need? Uh, But sometimes a person comes in and you can feel the darkness inside them. And by darkness, in this case, I don't mean evil. Mm -hmm. I mean depression. And they sort of walk over to the chair where they could sit. They walk too slowly. The face is full of sadness. Some of them almost start crying before they're in the chair. They are totally hopeless. And when I feel that hopelessness, I already know enough to begin treatment. Of course, I'll ask a million questions about why do you feel hopeless and when did that begin and so on. But in the end, therapy that is good, therapy that works is one heart to the other. 
It's nothing more or less than that. If you go for therapy and you walk into your therapist's office the first time and uh, they look scary or they look the other kind of dark, Mm. which is to say they have certain qualities which might be harmful to you. That's not a good beginning. But the darkness is very often exactly where CPTSD begins for the therapists. So we walk in, we sit down with them, and we can feel that darkness. Mm -hmm. After all, each of us has been trained for years to be able to do that. And the darkness is a central feature of PTSD. But there are a lot of therapists who don't realize that the darkness is the center of the problem. They've lost hope. How can you do anything well? How can you enjoy anything if there is no hope left in you? It's a great question and one that we always ask in therapy, what can we do to shift this? Or or what can the client do to shift this? And... um, I really appreciate that you're saying we can feel it because for therapists who I say are worth the salt, you know, therapists that are good therapists um, do relate to people as people instead of subjects. And right. And just a note, a lot of us who became therapists did so to figure out our own healing process. And so one of the reasons I think we can feel the darkness is because we've felt the darkness and we've been in the darkness. So Where would we go with that, Asha, as a client or as a clinician? Well, when that happens to me, when that person walks into my office for the first time, or I see them on a screen, which I don't like nearly as much, I start feeling their darkness because darkness is transmittable. And it's very important to know that if you're a therapist, Mm. because the more clearly you can feel what they're feeling, the more accurate the treatment can be. It's like we we get into a coherence. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So first, we want to ask, who are you? Of course, we don't just say, who are you? We say it in various ways with various questions. And what is hurting you? What is enraging you? Once we get some kind of sense of what the person is living internally, and if what we're hearing is that kind of painful, hopeless darkness, we don't have to do what we used to do with this in therapy. We used to not notice, and that's in quotes. Sometimes we noticed very well, but we didn't know how to treat it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was too scary for us to notice, so we sort of let it slide by. Mm -hmm. And very often our uh, clients also let it slide by because of how scary that is to look in the face. So I'm talking about something which therapists are becoming proficient with now. There are all sorts of new ways of focusing on it and treating it. Mm -hmm. Rather than it feeling like it's going to engulf both the therapist and the client. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let me tell you a little bit about Anita. Okay. Who is a client of mine and who has given me permission to discuss what I'm about to tell you. She came into therapy with me six years ago. Some of you may think six years is way too long a time for a therapy. I assure you that when someone has that kind of darkness, they need every minute of it. Because all of them has been stolen and wrapped in darkness and closed up in darkness. There's nothing else but that kind of horrible, horrible darkness. The first thing I want to do 
as an AIT therapist is find out the cause of the darkness. Because in AIT, we still believe in cause and effect being related to each other. So I ask, what do you think caused this? And very often, it is something so far back in their lives that they barely remember it. It is definitely trauma. Sometimes they know something terrible happened, as Anita did, but they can't tell you what it is because their psyches have tried for their entire lives to block off knowledge of it for fear that it would drive the person crazy. Mm -hmm. And that fear is justified fear. It is. Mm -hmm. So that protection has to be removed in such a way that it is no longer needed before it's removed. And that's where the therapist as caring, empathic, uh, sometimes loving in a healthy way can come forward and can say, I really hear what you're saying. And the client can talk more about this darkness simply because they can feel in their hearts that we care. It's not the fake caring of, hello, how are you doing? It's the real caring of, oh my, this really hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. So I found out pretty early in the game that simply asking about early trauma was the way into the problem because the cause of that kind of darkness and of a lot of the CPTSD symptoms that go with it, the cause is multiple traumas, multiple traumas um, that are repetitive traumas. They go on and on over and over and over, seeming never to stop. Mm -hmm. And the other horrendous thing about this kind of trauma is that it goes on. There is little or no possibility of escaping from that darkness. So it creates a tremendous hopelessness. And many people become suicidal facing that darkness because there's no way out. There's no place to run. There's no one to go to except you're trying this therapist because you heard from a friend that maybe they can help. But aside from that, there's, there's nothing. And your parents, of course, have told you to shut up a lot of the time. So you can't go to the people you would ordinarily go to when you're very small for any kind of help. So, you're stuck in a position that you cannot move from. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if AIT enters this. AIT is a therapeutic modality which does nothing but treat traumas. They can be as multiple as they are. They can be as repetitive as they are. And AIT can remove the energy which is filled with the noxiousness, filled with the negativity, filled with the hurt that these kinds of traumas come with. It's so a miracle. As, yeah. So as most, as most people see when they first try it, it left and it stayed gone. Oh, so that's, had, that's been the number one thing for my own healing and for the healing of all of my clients is that no matter how much therapy we've gone to, right? I graduated from therapy three times before I found energy psychology <laughs> and actually started healing, right? Oh, and that's and not- had a lot of patience too. And desperation, oh. <laughs> right? And, and I think that's true for a lot of the people listening to this podcast is that they have made, have tried therapy multiple times. As have and, I. 
<laughs> and so, and the thing about AIT is that it doesn't come back. Now, you might uncover something else to work on, right? So it's not like you go in for one AIT appointment and everything's wrapped up and you're all better. Um, no. I wish that were true. Maybe we can get there. But uh, I just wanted to put a, an idea of encouragement out to our audience that if you have tried therapy repeatedly, maybe it's not you. Maybe it's the therapy and finding something different may be helpful. Please continue. You were talking about how AIT can interrupt multiple traumas, singular traumas, and alleviate some of that darkness. Right. And the alleviation of, of that darkness is a darkness that comes especially from the same trauma being repeated for years. I have a list somewhere on my desk of all the traumas uh, that I had, that I had to take away in order to get rid of the sense that the world hates me and everybody hates me. Mm. You know, it's very nice to sit here in a comfortable chair and not feel hated. Yes. I would wish that on everybody to just have the feeling of the goodness of, of the world, the goodness of a life without making it up because it's expected of you. Okay, so we start treatment with looking at the person's ego. Sometimes they are so fragile that we can't do very much of this wonderful trauma treatment at first. First, we have to confront with them their fragility and lovingly and gently take it away. Mm -hmm. And then you get clients who are already, you know, really strong people. They have weathered the process of going through those very dark, very early traumas over and over again, and it's gone. But the darkness still comes back. That is, for many of us, not enough. So what do you do? you go to the next aspect of complex PTSD, which I would say is ego center connection breaking. So let me say a few words about the center. Okay. Because you almost, you almost jumped right on it before in a beautiful way. The center used to be considered a part of the human spirit, and it is. But there is no real differentiation except that our intellects make between the human spirit and the human psyche. In fact, there is no real differentiation between the human spirit and psyche and, believe it or not, the human body. And modern neuroscience is showing the truth of that as we sit here. It sure is. An it's an exciting time. It really is. Mm -hmm. And you can just can't keep up, <laughs> at least I can't. Okay, so why is that darkness so dark? It's so dark because the center, which is living in what we sort of falsely call the spirit, the center breaks away from the ego and that's a part of the human being that you all know very well. It's the part that says me, okay? It's the part that says, no, I want a salami sandwich. I don't want some other kind of sandwich. It's the part that controls things, that makes decisions, that moves us toward things. And it's the one with a lot of inner energy that moves us toward our goals or not, depending on how much trauma there is, okay? So in a healthy person, the ego and the center are very, very close friends. Mm. They help each other do their jobs. The job of the center is to encourage the rest of the human being to work hard to become a whole, well-differentiated person who has a goal in life, who has positive values, and who certainly doesn't have that darkness. 
So when, when this person is a little kid and all these traumas are happening, the traumas get to a certain point where they actually break the connection between the ego and the center, the ego being the real workhorse, the center being the part of us that tells us what's valuable to do, what's beautiful to do. It's the part that turns toward spirituality, that turns toward religion. And all the ways we turn towards these things are beautiful. So when the ego center connection, uh, connection breaks, what can't the center do? Because remember, it's totally broken off from the ego. When that break occurs, the center can't self-soothe the person, can't self-love the person, can't self-forgive the person, can't bring positivity back to the person's psyche because it's over there somewhere. It's not here with the person. So because its primary function is to bring light to the human being. And I think you all know how important it is for there to be light in us. Okay. It's more important than almost anything else because where can positive purpose come from if we don't have light inside ourselves? Not easy, maybe not even possible. So if we really want to leave the darkness or to help a client leave the darkness, we not only have to look at all the traumas that cause the darkness and remove their energy from the person. No, we have to put ego and center back together again as if they were two halves of a broken doll. That's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And just treating trauma doesn't do it for most clients. We have to do more than that. We literally have to bring the light into the person again. That sounds a little complicated. <laughs> actually, it's easy. Nice. So... We strengthen the client's ego with AIT. We do it by treating all the traumas that damage the ego. And once the client has a sense of what his ego or her ego actually is, they can't wait to give you the list of what you have to treat. And that part is actually quite easy. So we're treating especially the repetitive traumas, if there are any left at that point. And the person is beginning to have a little bit of light. <clears throat> but at this stage, they're not able to hold on to the light consistently. You know how sometimes the phone has rung in your house or in your pocket and Someone, someone nasty is on the phone. And maybe it's about something in the business you're in. Maybe it's about something very personal to you, but they're nasty. And by the time you finish dealing with them and you both hang up, you're in the dark again. Mm -hmm. Over and over and over. Maybe at first it happens three times a day. Maybe as you're treating more and more, it happens less. But who wants that? What positive thing does it give us in our lives? I think very little. So we have to go further. And the obvious way to go further is first to treat the fact that ego and center are split apart. Mm -hmm. The connection is broken. With AIT, the same way we treated all the traumas. And that helps a lot. For some people, that's all they need. For other people, they need more. I don't like to stop things when they're not finished. 
So I started experimenting extensively when I had two, three, four clients in my present practice with the problem. A lot of people got more seriously wounded in the last few years because of what was happening in the world. So I am seeing this kind of wounding much more frequently in my practice. Okay, so what can you do? Well, some years ago, people got very excited, or some people did, when they discovered that some PTSD could be treated with meditation. And I'm a lifelong meditator, so I said, far out. And then I realized, well, why is it only meditation when there are so many incredibly powerful spiritual practices everywhere on the planet? I started experimenting with them. And I discovered basically that the real issue is which spiritual practice suits which client. It isn't meditation is the one and only spiritual practice that's going to work for this. So it's, it's, it's much simpler if you can say to your client, you're going to need to work with a spiritual practice in addition to our trauma work because the spiritual practice will bring the light back in. And I started trying spiritual practices I had never tried before because I wanted to be well enough informed to do what I was telling people to do. Mm -hmm. And that worked really, really well. There was one afternoon I was walking with a friend in the woods. I live around mountains and woods, and it's a wonderful way to be spiritual without even calling it that. And she went off in one direction and I went off in the other. And I was walking down a little, a little earthen path that was parallel to the little river that was there. And I'm surrounded by beautiful different greens. And I can see mountain peaks of fair height just ahead of me. And I'm in heaven. And as I keep walking, I come to a bridge. And I thought to myself, shall I stay on this side or go to the other side? Because I could see the path continued on both sides. So I started crossing the bridge. And when I got halfway across, all of a sudden, there was like a soundless ringing of bells. And I was in an altered state of consciousness. Now, I started out that morning sort of mildly depressed, and it got worse because of what my friend had been telling me about her marriage. It was falling apart. There are two people I love. I stood there in the middle of the bridge and just let happen to me what was happening. And what was happening, I realized later, was that my ego and my center were coming together after they had sort of pulled apart because of my friend's news about her marriage. And I could feel the dark, it was like black smoke. I could feel the dark sort of floating out from my very pores. And then I could feel the light, sun was absolutely overhead, it was about noon. Sunlight coming down, coming in. And when I looked up again, I was light. And it was an incredible experience of feeling like I am a whole integrated human being. As you said before, after all those years of therapy, here it is on a bridge in the country. No office, no therapist. And that's when I knew that my ego and center had come together again and that that was needed by my clients as much as it was needed by me. So I started teaching them what became the bridge meditation. And um, it has done incredibly good work on everybody I've tried it on. 
So what that developed into was one visualization that everybody could use because people react strongly to it and very positively. And then I started adding spiritual practice after spiritual practice. And since my practice is international, the people I see are from all over the planet. Um, they were teaching me new practices. And I was remembering practices I'd known for years. And that turned out to be the part of treating that dark um, pitch black night that turned out to be the the top of it the best part of it the part that people really jumped into some people were resistant to it because they had negative ideas about words like spirituality religion meditation the list goes on and on and I simply treated them for whatever trauma they attached to those words. So you see, this is not a difficult thing that no one can learn but some esoteric psychoanalysts. It is simply treat the early traumas in order to get rid of what caused the breaking apart of ego and center. And as you treat more and more trauma, start using the spiritual practice or practices of your choice. Not that some therapist told you, but that you know in your heart, that's it. And do it for long enough that you are feeling the result of your hard work. Does that work for 100% of the people I've tried it on? You know the answer as well as I do. No way. But if it works for 80% of the people, that's better than a lot of medical people are doing with some of the very difficult diseases they're confronted by. Mm -hmm. So I'd say we were doing very well with this. I wanted to bring it here because when I read about um, when I read about the work that's done, the things that are talked about in this podcast, I thought I couldn't give you anything better that we have at AIT because this sort of takes it takes the bottom out of the negative. And all of a sudden, everything isn't bad anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not helpless anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to ask me, how come this works? Here's what I think. And this may be the only slightly difficult to understand thing if you have no background in psychoanalysis. So I'm warning you right now. Don't worry if you don't understand it. If you really want to understand it, you will find a way. So in psychoanalysis, we talk about introjection as one process of the psyche. Introjection means taking psychological contents from someone else or something else and making it a part of your inner being, of your psyche of your depths. What I think I have discovered in working with this new model is that when the child is a small child being traumatized right and left all day, all week, all month, all year, what happens is that the darkness of that child's uh, person who's wounding them Let's say it's a parent. Let's say it's a school teacher. Let's say it's someone uh, who rapes little children. That negativity can be interjected by the victim, him or herself. And when that interjection happens, 
they self-define as dark, often as evil. They hate themselves. They don't have any respect for themselves. They feel a lot of shame. This list, if I had it in front of me, it goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. All the negative things that the person who's hurting them deserves to be said about, the poor child thinks are his or hers qualities. So if you have the problem of the child introjecting all that horrible stuff and thinking it's their own stuff, how do you fix that? Treat trauma. Mm -hmm. If you treat the traumas that, that the child has based all of this on, and you start with spiritual practice also. In other words, exactly what I've told you for adults. Then it's possible for the child to let the interjection go. That to me was the part that was really exciting. Because we don't talk a lot anymore in psychology, in psychotherapy, about things like interjection. Mm-hmm. Our profession has changed in that it's become more superficial. I want the new neurological information. It's fantastic. It's helpful. I can make better phrases because I know some of it now. But not at the expense of the depths because the, the most damaging trauma is down as far as it can excuse me, is down as far as it can go. Mm -hmm. So you really can do what I'm talking about. It would help to know AIT, though. It does help to know AIT. And I think I just want to speak real quick on a, a point that you're making, which is our profession has gotten more shallow. While we've gotten really fantastic answers to some of our deeper questions. And so... For those of you who may be clinicians out there, please keep in mind that while it's um, in vogue and smart to learn about somatic therapies, and AIT itself has a somatic component to it, sure. when we take out the development of how our, how our psychology develops, we can really reduce our clients to having magic buttons on their bodies. And when that doesn't work, then we get frustrated with them and we're back in the same old cycle of blaming the victim instead of removing the root. So I'm really, really glad that you spoke about that today, Asha. It worries me. Mm -hmm. It As, worries me too. Yeah. I know who I was before really deep therapy. My first therapy was Jungian. So I got the deepest there is right at the outset. And it really made a difference in who I became. I want everyone to have those choices. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I like I said at the beginning, I graduated from traditional therapy three times. Traditional being primarily a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. um, but also some systems mm -hmm. based therapies. And um, energy psychology is what saved me. My initiation into that was actually healing from the body level up, which I'm sure you recall. Um, yes. But and and it's an excellent therapy. I really appreciate that. And my life changed when I learned AIT because not only did it take that's right, not only did it take those core deep things that we're talking about, and I'm still working on them because there's they go very very deep, very yeah. deep. Um, in fact, so deep we don't know they're there right? It just feels like who we are. Uh, energy psychology shifted things because first it was the first brand or, of modalities where we felt things in our body. And that was appropriate, <laughs> right? And important information. And so when I started realizing that I could feel the charge run through me, I also started realizing I could feel the charge of my introjects. And so believe you me, the day I saw my dad's finger come out when I was talking to my son, <laughs> I went and had a conversation with uh, all myself 
uh, to figure out how to shift that energy back away because that's something I thought I had healed and there it was. Yep. Um, and I did and apologize. Where, and where, I you, where you stood, everyone stands. Yes. But if you can get down to the very, very deep stuff, some of it is fantastic, wonderful, mind-blowing. Some of it is the causes of where you're stuck now. And I don't mean you personally, but where everybody is stuck. Mm -hmm. And if you can if you can develop the strength to lift those old, old, old wounds up to the light of day, that's fantastic because then you can say goodbye to them. Mm -hmm. And good riddance. Good riddance.